Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello, good morning, and welcome to NYBG's talk, In the Shadow of Slavery, Africa's Food Legacy in the Atlantic World. I'm Lisa Whitmer, Senior Director of Adult Education. Before I begin our program, I just have a few bits of Zoom-related housekeeping to go over. Uh, we do have closed captioning available. If you'd like to use it, please click on the live transcript or CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the talk, and we encourage you to put them in the Q&A as opposed to the chat. So Q&A is your space for questions, um, and we encourage you to put them in there as soon as they come to you. <clears throat> you will not interrupt the program, and that way we'll gather a rich group of questions um, for our speaker at the end. I will come back on screen to moderate the Q&A when Dr. Carney is finished. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Judith Carney, Distinguished Professor of Geography at UCLA. When I began investigating who we might invite to speak on African contributions to new world horticulture, Dr. Carney's name kept coming up again and again. Her groundbreaking research on the contributions of enslaved African peoples to new world agriculture and ecology laid the foundation for modern thinking on this topic. She has done fieldwork in both Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America for years, and she is the author of numerous research articles and two books, Black Rice, The African Origins of Rice Cultivation in the Americas, and In the Shadow of Slavery, Africa's Food Legacy in the Atlantic World. The latter won the prestigious Frederick Douglass Book Prize from Yale University. Dr. Carney's work has also been awarded many fellowships from institutions such as the Guggenheim Foundation and the American Council of Learned Societies. And she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2017. So we are in the presence of a giant and we are in for a treat. So with that, please welcome Judith Carney. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for the lovely, uh, generous um, introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here today and to share uh, my research with all of those who are present. So thank you for that. Um, let me start then. Um, the decades following 1492 were momentous on several levels not only because Europeans arrived in the Americas and began wars of conquest and settlement, but also because European overseas expansion led to the unprecedented exchange of plants, animals, and microbes <clears throat> between several continents. This movement of species, both intentional and unintentional, seen and unseen, historian Alfred W. Crosby famously called the Columbian Exchange. Crosby was not just interested in the novel species that naturalists brought back to Europe, but also in the plants and animals that European immigrants deliberately introduced to the Americas. His research importantly recognized that the agents of biological and botanical transfer were not just prominent men of science, but ordinary people as well. Indeed, during the age of European colonization, European settlers with their old world food crops and livestock transformed the environments of New England, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa into familiar landscapes, or in Crosby's words, neo-Europe. Yet there was another significant intercontinental transfer of species that occurred in the new world over the same period of time as the European mediated Columbian exchange. In this instance, we discovered that the agents of plant establishment were African that the migrants were enslaved and that the plant transfers involved tropical species from Africa. Although the Colombian exchange celebrates the role of new world crops in revolutionizing African food systems, its scholarship accords little attention to the similar role of African food staples 
in tropical and subtropical America. Yet, the African plant transfers were unlike any other discussed in the Columbian exchange literature for they unfolded as a direct consequence of the transatlantic slave trade, which forcibly migrated more than 12 million Africans to the Americas. And what I'd like to do today is to bring attention to the neglected African components of the Columbian exchange and to talk about how they influence the distinctive food ways of former plantation societies. And what I'll do is make four main points. First, the African contribution to new world food ways comes into focus when we consider that the enslaved produced not only well-known export commodities such as cotton, tobacco, sugar, and rice, Slaves also cultivated food crops necessary for their own sustenance. Um, my emphasis on subsistence also draws attention to the importance of food grown in Africa for the transatlantic commerce in human beings. Third, the agency of enslaved Africans in instigating the cultivation of these food crops should not be ignored. And finally, a closer look at this agency shows that the enslaved grew food in the interstices of plantation landscapes, namely in their small dooryard gardens and in the food plots allowed them. These marginal spaces in plantation societies emerge as pivotal sites for establishing African food staples in the new world. One of the striking features of the history of the early plantation period is the number of European accounts that credit slaves with the introduction of specific foods all previously grown in Africa. We can identify at least two dozen food plants that naturalists and visitors to plantation societies claim that the enslaved introduced. These African crops include, <coughs> excuse me, yams, sorghum, millet, sesame, black-eyed and pigeon peas, the kola nut, oil palm, and okra. If we take at their word commentaries penned by diverse historical figures, such as Hans Sloan, who founded the British Museum and resided in Jamaica at the end of the 17th century, Willem Piso and Georg Markgraf, naturalists on the first scientific expedition to Brazil in the 1640s, Thomas Jefferson and others who made these claims, we might ask, how is it possible that slaves introduce crops to the Americas? After all, Africans were brought to plantation societies in bondage and without personal possessions. Crediting enslaved Africans with plant introductions attributes to them an agency that is entirely at odds with longstanding historical perceptions. So why? Why would Jefferson and these other prominent historical witness, witnesses claim specific crops as slave introduction to plantation societies? And to answer this, I will augment a sparse written record by considering other kinds of evidence than historical documents alone. I'll draw upon diverse research methodologies that include oral histories, food systems, archeological findings, historical linguistics, material culture, landscape vestiges, artwork, and even recent genetics research to shed light on what can be called the African components of the Columbian exchange. Together, these diverse sources can offer uniquely informative texts to construct knowledge about the contributions of enslaved people who were for the most part unable to leave written records. As shown in this rock art from the Sahara of women gathering grain some 4,000 years ago, 
African food crops are emblematic of an ancient and continuous process of agricultural domestication and innovation on the continent. The foods Africans domesticated include four cereal crops, half a dozen root crops or tubers, several oil producing plants, pasture grasses, a few distinctive vegetables, fruit and nut crops, coffee, and the bottleneck gourd. For instance, the African continent harbors an indigenous species of rice, Ariza globarima. Africans independently domesticated this separate species of rice more than 3,000 years ago. During the era of transatlantic slavery, slave ship captains routinely purchased this African rice as rations to provision their captives. One 18th century captain even drew and described the African rice field you see depicted in this image. Rice is an introduced crop to the Americas and the African globarima rice was likely first established before the arrival of Asian Ariza sativa rice, which has now become the dominant rice species. Africans similarly domesticated two species of the tropical tuber, yam. So important was the yam as a dietary staple that seasonal festivals commemorating its harvest were common, as we see depicted in early 19th century Ghana, a festival that, by the way, is still celebrated in parts of Jamaica. Africans also contributed in important ways to the development of several Asian crops that reached the African continent millennia ago through Indian Ocean trading networks as shown here. And you can even see an image from the 13th century uh, of a um, ship flying the Indian Ocean showing Africans on board. For instance, the banana and its cousin, the cooking banana, otherwise known as plantain, arrived in Africa from Southeast Asia via India between two and 3,000 years ago, as did another important Asian root crop, taro, Colocasia esculenta. The rich history of African domestication and experimentation belies contemporary perceptions of Africa as a hungry continent, one that presumably has always depended on food introduced from elsewhere for the survival of its peoples. During the transatlantic slave trade, Africa in fact routinely produced surplus food. We know this from slave ship manifests as well as from drawings and commentaries of ship captains. Slave ships carried some food stores from Europe, but their captains also relied on African food surpluses to provision the enslaved captives across the Middle Passage. The transatlantic journey could last eight weeks or more, so sufficient food stores were vital. Local markets for food and live animals, you see sheep in this image, um, uh, flourished near European coastal forts in West Africa. Slave ship captains purchased not only African food staples, but also Amerindian crops that had been introduced, such as maize and the peanut, which had been already established in the early 16th century in West Africa. This image illustrates the extent of land cultivated to food crops near European forts along the West African coast. The West African region from Senegal to Liberia, known then as the Upper Guinea coast, also provided African medicinal plants, such as the castor bean and the kola nut, which is a mild stimulant. The kola nut, of course, is the second component of Coca-Cola. It is depicted in this drawing by a 17th century slave ship captain who learned from Africans that the traditional practice of adding a few kola nuts to stagnant, spoiled drinking water would restore its potability. 
This was a very useful additive for freshening casks of water on a long Atlantic sea voyage. I bring up the cola nut to remind us that before the end of the 19th century, nearly all medicines came directly from plants and nature. Coca-Cola is in fact the product of two indigenous plant knowledge systems, Amerindian coca and African cola that came together in the world's most popular soft drink. Slave ships also carried live animals from Africa intended as fresh meat for their crews. Pigs and sheep can be seen in this image of a French slave ship departing Angola. The transatlantic slave trade occurred in the era before there was refrigeration. Meat and fish were either salted or pickled for later consumption. The only way to consume fresh meat was by transporting live animals, as you see here, quartered in cages off the sides of slave ships. Here in two drawings from the 17th century, we see the African hare or wool-less sheep, bred for its meat, not its wool. Af European traders knowingly exported African breeds to the New World tropics because African food animals were better adapted to tropical heat and humidity than their Northern European counterparts. And please recall that Western Hemisphere had no domesticated sheep, goats, cattle, or horses before the arrival of Europeans and Africans. All these food animals were introduced. While in Brazil, the naturalist Georg Markgraf also drew the African guinea fowl. This African food animal arrived in New World plantation societies on the first boatloads uh, that were recorded of enslaved Africans. This image of the Caribbean island of Barbados in the 1640s shows that camels too were present in the early plantation period. The map clearly shows an African tending this notoriously truculent animal. Camels served as pack animals to carry heavy loads to coastal ports. But camels did not arrive in the New World from Arabia. They came from West Africa, where they had formed an important component of livestock herds in the semi-arid region between Morocco and the Senegal River having been introduced there from Arabia since antiquity. When the Spanish completed their conquest of the Canary Islands in the 15th century, they raided the African mainland, today's Morocco and Western Sahara. It's just a hundred kilometers away. And in across those hundred kilometers, they brought camels, cattle, sheep, goats, and enslaved people. Indeed, the mainland peoples were known as skilled herdsmen. During European maritime expansion, these Atlantic islands, especially the Canary Islands and the Cape Verde archipelago, served as crucial entrepots for provisioning ships bound to Africa and the Americas. African food plants, livestock and peoples were carried from the mainland to these offshore islands. This represented the initial geographical extension of African agro-pastoral knowledge systems beyond the continent. The dwarf West African cattle also contributed to the development of livestock breeds suitable to the New World tropics. Since cattle adapted to tropical climates were in great demand on sugar plantations for turning millstones to crush sugarcane, for transport, and as a source of manure for fertilizing sugarcane fields. We know as this drawing from West Africa from the late 17th century, as this drawing shows us, that live cattle were indeed taken from land and loaded onto slave ships. 
The Senegambian Endama cattle is a small and portable breed that easily fit into canoes as we see in this image. It readily adapted to the high temperature and humidity of tropical lowland America, where recent DNA studies indicate its presence in some New World Creole cattle. African pasture grasses arrive with these animals indirectly as the bedding and animal fodder necessary for their transport on ships to the Americas. In tropical America, these African pasture grasses were deliberately sown, sometimes even as a plantation crop, as we see with Guinea grass, um, Panicum maximum, in this sketch from pre-revolutionary Haiti. And a geographer, um, professor of mine actually, James Parsons, memorably coined the transatlantic dispersal of African pasture grasses to tropical America the Africanization of New World Tropical Grasslands. African grasses provided indispensable forage for maintaining the vast livestock herds that developed in the New World tropics and which drew the attention of Alexander von Humboldt and other European naturalists. These tropical grasses were cut and brought to urban areas as fodder for stable dairy cows and horses. And what I'd like to do at this point in my uh, talk with you today is to place all these African components of the Colombian exchange in broader perspective. Slavery lasted nearly four centuries in the Americas until the second decade of the 19th century, more Africans arrived in the new world than Europeans. We can document at least 35,000 transatlantic slave voyages over these centuries. The lengthy sea voyage across the Atlantic carrying enslaved peoples was, however, but one leg of a many segmented journey. Indeed, the business of slavery operated across vast geographical space as a kind of transnational commodity chain. Each segment, the capture of Africans, their incarceration at coastal slave depots such as Elmina Castle in Ghana, their forced migration aboard slave ships and sail at the auction blocks of the Americas represented a series of transactions that were carried out by a shifting set of owner beneficiaries. Profits within each segment of the commodity chain depended on the efficient transfer of Africans to the next set of owner beneficiaries. This multi-sided transaction across the Atlantic basin included the transmission of useful information to facilitate the spatial movement of enslaved captives to the next segment, food, and the African locations where it could be purchased was an indispensable part of this commerce. Captains of slavers arriving along the Western African coast learned what African food surpluses were sold and where. But how Africans grew these crops was of little importance on a transatlantic voyage. Thus, by the time the captives reached the auction blocks of New World slave ports, the only persons in the commodity chain experienced in cultivating these tropical food staples and preparing them as food were the enslaved Africans themselves. The entire success of a long slaving voyage depended vitally on adequate food and water supplies to keep the captives alive en route. New World maize, peanuts, and manioc, or cassava, certainly contributed to the food demand generated in African slave ports, 
but so did native African grains and tubers. This image from the coast of Ghana illustrates key crops grown in Africa that were sold as slave ship provisions. African rice, pearl millet, black eyed peas, hibiscus and melagetta pepper are featured along with New World maize, Asian ginger and sugarcane. Archival records suggest that slave ship captains often showed a distinct preference for purchasing African food staples as rations, believing that mortality rates on the Atlantic crossing improved when captives were fed foods to which they were accustomed. Given modern perceptions of Africa as a continent perpetually vulnerable to food shortages, it is thus surprising to discover that during the transatlantic slave trade, when millions of its able-bodied young people were forcibly migrated, African societies managed to produce food surpluses in such quantity as to provision thousands of slave voyages. These indigenous African food crops were tropical plants and for the most part unknown in Europe. European ship captains had no names for many of these novel food staples and often identified them with geographical descriptors. For instance, Europeans frequently affixed the geographical descriptor or toponym, Guinea, to reference previously unfamiliar species from the African continent, or Guinea, as the continent was known during this era. Examples of the term's usage in English include Guinea corn for sorghum, Guinea pepper, Guinea grass, even Guinea fowl. This painting from Mexico in the 1760s shows the fruit banana labeled as Platino Guineo. Bananas are still called Guineos in former plantation areas of Eastern Cuba, Puerto Rico, El Salvador, Ecuador, and along Colombia's Caribbean coast. For West Africa, or Guinea, as it was then known, was where Europeans first came across the banana, which had been introduced to Africa more than a thousand years before the arrival of Europeans. This is an early 19th century painting of a French slave ship. On the deck, enslaved women were separated from the men. And note the barricade that you see uh, on the right of the image. Females were quartered near the vessel's galley or cooking area. I should add that we must never forget the sexual violence and abuse that occurred on these slave ships. Enslaved women were at times put to work in meal preparation. Archival records also reveal that slave ship captains purchased as rations African grain crops such as rice, sorghum, and millet, and they purchased them in both milled and unmilled forms. And this distinction that I'm making between milled and unmilled grain is critically important. For any grain purchased in the husk with its hull still on, that is, it's not yet been milled or cleaned, required doing so at sea to ready it for human consumption. This is an 18th century painting of another slave ship, the Danish slave ship Friedensborg. It is a remarkable painting if you look carefully at a small detail along the ship's quarter deck, right there. Closer illustration illustrates something that is often left out of standard historical accounts of slave ships. And I've added the highlighting so you can see this. We see here a rare depiction of African women preparing food on the slave ship. They are involved in the labor of lifting wooden pestles, hand pounding or milling the grain, a task that has long been associated with women's work in Africa. 
The expanded view clearly shows two enslaved females with hand held pestles milling grain in the traditional African way in a wooden mortar. Furthermore, the image tells us that their labor was needed to process grain because it was purchased unmilled, that is with the grain's inedible hulls still attached. Significantly, and this I believe is critical for understanding the African components of the Colombian exchange, any unmilled grain and only a grain not yet milled is also a seed. In other words, any unmilled grain remaining from a slave voyage could potentially serve as seed for growing it elsewhere. In this image, we don't know if the women are hand milling sorghum, millet, or rice, but we do know that none of these African crops were present in the Americas prior to the arrival of Europeans and Africans. Not many slave ships arrived in the Americas with leftover food stores, but those that occasionally did presented the enslaved an opportunity to access seeds and rootstock of familiar crops and the possibility to reestablish them in new lands. And this image brings to mind a counter narrative of crop introductions still recounted by the descendants of runaway slaves who are known as Maroons. In Maroon communities across Northeastern South America, rice is an esteemed food. These communities share a similar oral history about rice beginnings. Their narrative describes rice as an introduced crop brought by an enslaved female forebear who hid seeds in her hair as she disembarked the slave ship. Here we see Edith Ajako and her daughter demonstrating how this was done. The precious seeds escaped detection and this, she explains, is how we came to grow rice. This maroon rice narrative thus underscores the significance of slave ships and enslaved women for seed transfers from Africa. In this oral, this oral history, moreover, substitutes the agents of global seed transfers celebrated by the Colombian exchange literature, which is to say European navigators, colonists, naturalists, and men of science. This narrative is substituting um, that uh, telling with the agency of enslaved African women whose deliberate efforts to disembark the slave ship with seed rice help them reestablish an African dietary preference in New World plantation societies. Colonial governments repeatedly sought to recapture those who ran away from slavery. Maroons essentially freed themselves by establishing clandestine settlements in remote areas where they were unlikely to be detected, such as in mountainous redoubts upstream of river rapids in rainforests or in swamp lands. This map of Barbados circa 1640 is probably the earliest visual representation we have of runaway slaves or maroons. It shows two male runaways being pursued by a man who is firing at them on horseback as they are trying to reach the mountains and perhaps freedom. Colon the colonial authorities in South American rainforest areas repeatedly launched military expeditions to destroy these hidden maroon outposts and to re-enslave the runaways as shown in this drawing. Now, uh, this is from a campaign of the 1730s in the interior of Dutch Guiana, today Suriname. Note the fleeing maroons, 
their village in flames, being pursued by mastiff dogs as some of the village defenders with only bows and arrows try to hold off the armed white militias, fully aware that death or re-enslavement await the community's defenders. Some of the pursuing militias left illustrations of the fugitives' food fields as in still another drawing from 18th century Dutch Guiana. Here we find evidence of maroon food preferences for African dietary staples, namely the cultivation of rice, plantain, and yams. Since publication of my first book, Black Rice, a Dutch botanist has located a maroon community in Suriname that still cultivates indigenous African globarima rice, which is in, from this, uh, written up in this article from Economic Botany in 2010. I also discovered a globarima, African rice globarima rice voucher in the British Natural History Museum, which was originally collected in 1849 from Matanzas, Cuba. The map on the right indicates, in fact, where African rice has been located in botanical collections in the Americas. Plantation slaves also grew African food staples in the small food plots allowed them and in the yards around their dwellings. These cultivation sites are, in fact, where slaveholders and naturalists in the New World often reported their first encounters with unfamiliar tropical crops we now recognize as from Africa. With no name for many of these novel crops in European languages, New World slaveholders and naturalists borrowed those that the enslaved used. In this way, some African vernacular crop names passed into New World colonial languages. In many West African languages, the word for yam, for yam is in yame. It also means to eat. The Portuguese adopted in yame for the yam, which became yame in Spanish and yam in English. In English, okra. Aki and Bisi for the kola nut are loan words from the Akan language of Ghana. South Carolina adopted the Senegambian Wolof word Beni for sesame. Portuguese Brazil appropriated the Bantu words Dende for the oil palm and Guanju for pigeon peas. Even banana, a word of unspecified West African origin represents another African linguistic borrowing. Thus, the African food staples introduced to tropical America appeared in tandem with the first generations of enslaved Africans. Slaves planted these tropical foods to ward off hunger, but also to reinstate longstanding dietary preferences. Many African tubers, notably, yams and plantains grew prolifically in the New World tropics and required little labor to prepare them as food. In the period of plantation development, enslaved Africans were often placed in charge of their own sustenance. They grew food in the small yards around their dwellings, in plantation areas set aside for cultivating subsistence crops and in marginal environments like swamps and hill slopes that were otherwise unsuitable for commodity production. In such sites of subsistence, the enslaved instigated and nurtured the cultivation of many African dietary staples. These humble food plots found in the interstices of plantation economies became, in effect, the botanical gardens of the Atlantic world's dispossessed. The trajectories of African crops in the plantation period are thus tied to the institution and processes of the transatlantic commerce in human beings. Slave ships carried African foods as rations 
for enslaved captives, from supplies occasionally left over from slave voyages, enslaved Africans accessed familiar seeds and tubers and pioneered their cultivation in plantation food plots. There, slaveholders discovered the African crops and at times, and this occurred with rice, exploited their commercial potential as profitable plantation commodities. In this way, we can now fully contextualize why Thomas Jefferson and other prominent colonial figures claim some food crops as slave introductions. And I'd like to conclude with this image from Bahia, Brazil. A critical feature of human migration the world over is the continuity of traditional food preferences across space and the dislocations of geography. That the migration of Africans was compelled through extremes of violence and privation does not diminish this universal desire or preclude the possibility of achieving it. African crops enable the enslaved at times to reinstate some food traditions of specific cultural heritages and to combine ingredients in new ways with Amerindian and European foods. In this way, the enslaved discreetly broke the monotony of any food regimen slaveholders might impose. Africans and their descendants thus profoundly shaped the food ways of plantation societies through the dishes that enslaved female cooks prepared for slaveholders. African foods stealthily made their way onto planters' tables. In this way, the African crop introductions encouraged the distinctive and today much celebrated regional cuisines that developed across plantation societies. Africa's food heritage in the Americas is built upon this not yet fully acknowledged foundation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was um, so full of interesting knowledge. And uh, particularly, I am struck by the primary source material that you use to illustrate the, the photos and the engravings and the paintings really, really bring what you um, have researched to life. So I'm just so thankful that you've shared this um, with us. I um, will remind the audience that we do have the Q&A um, feature in the toolbar, which if you um, go ahead and type what you uh, want to ask, I will go ahead and ask it. If you see a question in the Q&A that you like and that you would like to have answered, please um, like it, give it the little thumbs up, and it'll float to the top. Um, I do just out of my own curiosity, um, Dr. Carney, want to ask how did you begin to study this? How, what's the story behind your attraction to the subject? You're obviously so passionate. You've dedicated your life's work to it. Talk, can you talk a little bit about how you came to, to this? Um, serendipity <laughs> so many things. I, um, I had the if I was a graduate student for a little longer than most grad students because I started out uh, doing my uh, master's research in Brazil where I intended to complete my PhD and it was in an area of Brazil where there was a lot of rice being grown, but I didn't, I didn't know much about plant history at that point in time. I was just looking at um, peasant farmers, uh, most mixed race people, uh, and uh, how they were managing just to get enough food to eat and the types of environments they were using. I'm a geographer and that's kind of something we always look at. And then um, a long story but, that I won't go into, I ended up in West Africa after I'd already taken my PhD exams. 
and uh, found people growing rice there as well. Mm -hmm. And it was gendered. It was a female crop where I was working, although in other parts of West Africa, men uh, do certain tasks in rice and women do others. So mm -hmm. women are always involved in rice cultivation when one sees it. And I became really interested in those systems that were um, being replaced by uh, irrigated um, machine type systems, uh, understanding that subsistence system, its history, why were they growing more rice? When did it come there? And before I knew it, uh, I had a dissertation that was mostly about the conflicts of land ownership in newly developed rice um, plantations uh, uh, um, in that area, uh, actually irrigated rice uh, facilities. And so that led me to write a lot about gender and struggles over resources. And then I was a professor at UCLA and uh, a historian said, well, do you know about this book that a uh, uh, historian uh, Peter Wood wrote about uh, this whole knowledge system of rice plantations in South Carolina and a connection to Africa? I read that book and it completely changed my directions. That was a revolutionary book for me. And I knew he was right. And I uh, had done so much field work by that point in two big rice areas of the Atlantic that it was um, driving me to look at what wasn't said by using visual imager, imagery and going through archival materials that aren't published, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's why I was saying to get at these histories, looking using different methodologies and being open to them uh, was really helpful in how I could put the, the story together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Um, already someone is, is wanting you to repeat the name of the book that was revolutionary for you. Oh, Peter Wood's uh, Black Majority. Peter Great. Wood, Black Majority. And Dan Littlefield, uh, also, A Rice and Slaves. They're both still in print. They're wonderful. So Excellent. Peter Wood's book was uh, 1974. I think Dan Littlefield, who uh, recently retired from the University of South Carolina, they're both now retired. Uh, Wood was at Duke. Um, they um, they really moved this narrative along with uh, combing so thoroughly through the historical records that I didn't need to do so much on that, just work with archival materials from Africa. And then my deep knowledge of these indigenous rice systems, how they worked, what mm -hmm. was involved in it. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to compare the, uh, the sort of way of managing a landscape and the looking at rice as something not just as what you eat, but from how it's grown and what type yeah. of habitat, what type of microenvironment, all the way through the steps that takes it as a prepared food on your table. Mm -hmm. And that whole um, American, and I mean American, North and South American uh, tradition of uh, rice as not the Asian tradition, which has rice clumped together. Mm -hmm. uh, they select for that, like a rice bowl. The African tradition is every grain sort of separate, which is mm -hmm. like also when you trace these cuisines and how they're prepared. Um, Hop and John, rice with black eyed peas, two African uh, staples. So uh, these composed dishes also became very interesting for me. And this woman and some of these dishes here are uh, Karaje and um, Oh yeah, like Uncle Ben's rice, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's an interesting story because uh, it's named, why is, why is our converted rice named after a person who was of African heritage? And it's the ways that advertising sometimes, if you interrogate it, uh, builds authenticity off of using what is a historical memory, but it's not put out as part of that tradition mm -hmm. that is part of that heritage in the in the Americas. Wow, the threads go so deep down. I um, 
really going to have to to think about that more. Um, I want to get to some of these um, questions from the audience. Sylvie um, Candy asks. What do you make of the sometimes presented argument that the importation of American crops and agricultural products enabled African demography to increase, reversing the detrimental effects of transatlantic slave trade? I'm actually not sure I understand that question. Oh, and I think what is meant is that the, the argument is that, um, the mortality was less in North America. Is that the context? Sylvie, if you want to come back on with another question to clarify, we can. Because sometimes it, uh, there's a discussion about uh, the enslaved having lesser mortality in North America than in other parts. Mm -hmm. And is that linked to food? Uh, well, it wasn't a day at the beach to be suddenly um, your rice that you are growing when you can around labor as an enslaved person um, and then you have to see it get appropriated so to speak by a plantation mm -hmm. owner who says oh these wetlands of South Carolina and Georgia oh that would grow just fine here and then it goes from being something that's part of your heritage and your mm -hmm. memory of families and lands lost to an appropriation that's going to enslave you in this work process. And in my book, Black Rice, I actually mm -hmm. talk about the task labor system as evolving as a sort of negotiation over this labor that people were forced to now do as a plantation crop. And by mediating the, mitigating somewhat the effect of that labor, by agreements about how much would be done, what would constitute a task yeah. in a day. But um, the, uh, the, the, this, this, uh, these were malarial areas too, mm -hmm. and it was falciparum malaria, the most lethal type of the four types of malaria that affects the cerebral um, area mm -hmm. and can lead to death and uh, the sickle cell trait evolved in relationship to that as mm -hmm. a means if you had one of each heterozygous you would likely not die from that malaria so it's a mixed bag in the sense of yeah these foods are sustaining people they become very important in terms of building rebuilding identity and 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 humanity under the conditions of oppression that they face. But with rice, some of these areas were difficult landscapes, mm -hmm. the rice plantations. Mm -hmm. um, to Walter Brandkamp is wondering, to what extent uh, were African crops cultivated here in the Northeast? Um, he mentions New York City being the, one of the second largest slave owning city in, in North America. Yeah, most of these crops are, uh, from what I gather, um, I haven't found too much. Mostly they're mid-Atlantic and south of there. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a gardener now in the Northeast, but maybe you can grow okra that far north or something. Because the weather would yeah, the, really the, change things. Yeah, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. could. I mean, yams actually morph a bit as you go into the mid-Atlantic where really a lot of yams are not yams, they're really sweet potatoes, which is new world, mm -hmm. um, but they ship the name and call it yams a lot of the time when it's truly sweet potatoes, but there, there seems to be a tolerance. Sweet potatoes can be grown farther in a temperate setting than can yams is my understanding, but black-eyed peas, maybe those could be grown in the summers, the humid summers of the Northeast. Mm -hmm. I just don't haven't found too much about it. There's probably mm -hmm. work there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Olivia Fuller um, asks, uh, can you elaborate on the practices of growing okra in Africa? Um, she says she's doing research in the Alabama Black Belt on okra and heirloom variety seeds. Mm -hmm. I actually don't know too much about the growing of it in, in um, West Africa, because where I was uh, working, they weren't growing a lot of okra actually. Um, so 
I'm sorry that I can't do that. Um, oh, that's but maybe yeah. Jessica Harris. Um, she's written a lot of books about foods in West Africa, and maybe one of her books. Um, there'll be some information on that. She's she's pretty well known, mm -hmm. and I recommend checking out some of her materials. Great. Um, Marlene is wondering if you can speak a little bit more about maize. Um, how and when did it reach Africa from the New World? Oh, okay. Um, well, um, and now I'm like going back to my graduate school days. But <laughs> reach back in there. Maybe <laughs> new materials brought out. But uh, last time, I found a, a reference for it was 1506, 1510. It's in West Africa already. And that's what like where the Columbian Exchange starts, right? It starts with everything's happening in Asia and everything's happening in the new world with all kinds of plant domestication. And then Africa, like right in the middle between the two areas, mm -hmm. is sort of written out of history because of this. That's why I kept mentioning always being seen as the hungry continent. And, uh, and that these new world crops, you know, cassava and, and the peanut and maize rescued and saved Africans from hunger. They did come over at a very early period of time. And just as Africans did in these garden plots in plantation societies, they readily took what was available around them and, and uh, grew them as their sustenance. So they readily are hybridizing and taking in these new world crops into their food systems. But where I left off with the manioc, it comes in a little later. Um, most of the, a lot of slave ships uh, use the flour, uh, which uh, stays pretty long on a slave voyage, but um, slave ship voyage, I should say. But um, the uh, bitter manioc requires a great deal of processing to remove the prussic acid or cyanide compound in it. So it didn't easily transfer. It required some time and adjustment and actually the return of some people who were enslaved um, from the Americas who were able to get back to Africa. Uh, in Nigeria, there's some evidence that they may have been involved in showing the methods of uh, taking, expressing out those poisonous compounds, which otherwise mm. could kill you, as we know from Jamestown in mm. Guyana with mm. that story. It was basically cyanide. And that's what you, you sort of you're getting off of this bitter manioc um, if you don't watch it. Wow. You don't express it and, and take out those compounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which reminds me, I do just, I have to personally pause on that image that the, the, the engraving, I think it was that you zoomed in on the women pounding, um, the grains. Um, and that is amazing to a detail to notice. And also that labor of feeding the captives on the ship is something that, um, I personally haven't thought too much about, and it's it, the whole economics around it is. Um... I'll tell you one thing, Lisa. Some some of the images, you know, they're they're small actually. So wherever I go, I have one of these. <laughs> nice, <laughs> very important. <laughs> What's going on on the deck? Because asking those kinds of questions, you know, like mm -hmm. there's so little written. Mm -hmm. And and when I wrote Black Rice, a young woman who was a graduate student in Uppsala in Sweden had been doing uh, just a, a dissertation topic and just came across like one fragmentary, uh, one fragment of a sentence that said women were pounding the grain on board. And it's just like gender is just like vanish from the most of the narratives. And it's in precisely those ways when like that part of the slave ship, there was a barricade. I didn't mention it in the second image. That part was where the women were placed on the quarter deck. And that's where the cooking stove was it moved to for us mm -hmm. on a slave ship. And, and people were um, involved in food preparation. So it was like 
getting this image spatially of like who's mm -hmm. where to then be able to identify that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it was an incredible learning process for me yeah. about how, how you can see in other ways than just through limited text by those who benefited for the most part from slavery mm -hmm. about what is going on mm -hmm. under the surface that isn't recorded that falls out sometimes from written records. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so it's really important. Um, we uh, have another question here um, who, and per, I see, I'm seeing the time, so perhaps we'll, we'll end with this one. Um, could you um, share some recommendations for more reading on this topic, uh, documentaries, articles, um, et cetera? There are um, quite a few people have um, given the thumbs up to that question. People are hungry to, to learn more. And definitely Judith's books, I will say, first of all, <laughs> Black Rice and in the Shadow of Slavery. Um, and then additionally, do you um, are there other scholars that you would point to or, or um, books that you would um, recommend that we um, dive into? Yeah, there's a really, uh, one coming out uh, next month or yeah, early June, maybe at the end of this month by Case Watkins, W-A-T-K-I-N-S, Palm Oil Diasporas, um, where he go, looks at palm oil's history in Brazil, in Bahia. Mm -hmm. That'll be really uh, worth a lot of people's um, uh, reading. Uh, there's a, bot, a book, um, what's it called? Uh, Robert A. Vokes, B-O-E-K-S, and uh, John Rashford, did an edited uh, book, Economic Botany of Africa Plants or something, but it's look up Robert A. Folks, V-O-E-K-S and John Rashford. That's a very nice collection of, uh, of chapters that deal with various parts of some of the crops I've been mentioning today. Uh, Robert uh, Vokes has done, uh, he's at Cal State Fullerton in geography. Mm -hmm. He has um, written a number of books that uh, on Bahia that talk about uh, candomblé and the use of plants in mm -hmm. that. And uh, I recommend taking a look at some of his publications as well. Um, oh, there's a lot going on right now. And mm -hmm the list could go on and on, but those are some that I think give you a really nice comprehensive um, picture. Um, there's a lot of people right now preparing books and uh, articles that I think are, that have come out of this broader research that mm -hmm. Peter Wood and Dan Littlefield um, opened up. And I'm grateful for uh, the way that this has developed. Um, uh -huh. to, it, it's it's a story that in the midst of so much tragedy and loss tells us so much about food and its mm -hmm. meaning, not just for sustenance, but also for shaping identity and, and meaning and in life. And I just think it's a very powerful, when you look at food in this way, becomes a very powerful way of understanding humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, we thank you so, so much for sharing your um, extensive knowledge with us. Um, we're so appreciative for you spending time um, teaching us this morning. Um, I will also um, just recommend to the folks out there that you might be interested in joining us on May 18th. We have Carolyn Roberts, who's a professor um, at Yale, who will be speaking about the research she's been doing on um, African plants that were used uh, for medicinal purposes. Um, uh, as well. So Medicine, Knowledge, and Power in the Atlantic Slave Trade, uh, Tuesday, May 18th with Carolyn Roberts at 11 a.m. Um, so Judith, thank you so much for, um, for being with us this morning. We really, um, really appreciate your work um, and your taking the time to be here today. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us.